Welcome to the next lecture on the theory of quantum entanglement. This lecture series is for the organization Chi Quantum, which is supporting women in uh, research and learning in quantum information science. Last time we talked about quantum channels as physical evolutions of quantum systems. We talked about their properties the main result is that quantum channels are completely positive trace preserving linear maps. So what does that mean? If you input a state to a quantum channel, the output is a state. Okay, now we're gonna move on and talk about uh, what's called purification of a quantum channel. Previously, we talked about how you can purify quantum states and how that's a pretty essential concept, at least it appears in quantum cryptography. Similarly, you can purify quantum channels, okay? And the, the new perspective that quantum information and quantum mechanics offers is that you can understand noise as arising from a unitary interaction with an inaccessible environment, right? So with the purification, we said that we can understand noise in a quantum state as being due to entanglement with a reference system that you don't have access to. And the, the concept is similar for quantum channels. Okay, and that is related to what's called Steinspring's theorem. Steinspring was the mathematician who, who had this idea in 1955, a long time ago. Okay, so the theorem says that for every quantum channel, you can find a pure state of the environment and a unitary matrix that acts on the input in the environment and produces an output system B and a environment that has a possibly different dimension as the original environment, such that the original channel is recovered by three steps. Tensor in the pure state, perform the unitary evolution on the joint system, and then trace out the environment. So the trace out corresponds to not having access to the environment, okay? And so that's possible for every quantum channel. So it's an important theorem. Ah, and now we arrive at the summary of states and channels. So every quantum state is a positive semi-definite matrix with trace equal to one. Uh, we defined entanglement, how quantum states of multiple systems they can be separable or entangled. Quantum states can be purified. This this notion of purification that we don't have that in classical information theory. Quantum channels are completely positive trace preserving maps. Uh, we didn't mention preparation channels, but that's like the reverse of a measurement channel. Preparation channel takes a classical system to a quantum system. A measurement channel is the reverse process. Quantum channels can be purified. And that's what we just talked about. Okay, so those are the main concepts that we've talked about in these, uh, these first few lectures. And now we're gonna move on to a concept called uh, distance measures. And what I've done here is I've taken this sort of perhaps overused meme, but this is from the PhD thesis of Chris Fuchs, who's a, a famous uh, quantum information theorist. Um, the, the quote from his thesis was that one does not simply reach into the space of quantum states, place a yardstick next to the line connecting the two of them and read off a distance. What we develop are more principled methods of measuring distances between quantum states. Why is this important? In quantum computing, there's an ideal process that you're trying to realize. But in practice, and it's very true nowadays, um, the quantum computations being realized are imperfect. And so you want a way of measuring how far is the ideal process from the imperfect one that you're implementing. You want to know how well you're doing. And so that's what these metrics allow for. Okay. So to do so, we need a, a few mathematical concepts, okay? 
One is called uh, the function, a function of a matrix. So let's suppose that we have a function f and we want to compute this function of a diagonalizable of a diagonal matrix. Okay, so suppose the original diagonal matrix has entries D1 through Dn on the diagonal. Then the way you apply a function to a matrix is just apply the function to each of the elements along the diagonal. But you only do it if X is in the domain of the function and otherwise you just set it equal to zero. That's one method of handling it, such that the out, you know, such that you get a matrix at the output of this process. Okay, so generalizing this, suppose that a matrix is diagonalizable, right? So you can write it as KDK inverse. That's what it means for a matrix to be diagonalizable. Then a function of the matrix is you just do the same thing to the diagonal elements, but then you put K and K dagger sandwiching on the outside. And that's a function of a matrix. And there are good reasons for defining it this way um, but we won't get into those. Suffice it to say that uh, if your function has a Taylor expansion, then you can write it as an infinite sum of polynomials. And then this is like the natural thing that you would do with, with polynomials. Okay. So if we evaluate the function only on the support of the matrix or in the, for the domain of the, the function, um, then we can have functions such as the inverse and the logarithm. And we can, we can have those for matrices. Okay, but let's, let's use this for a particular function, the square root. So there's something called the trace norm of a matrix and it's defined in this way. So how do you compute it? You take X and X dagger, you multiply them. The function you apply to that matrix is the square root function. And then you apply the trace. Okay. And if you know, um, if you know the singular value decomposition, the trace norm will simply be the sum of the singular values of the matrix X. So that's, that's something you can prove and uh, as an interesting exercise. Okay, the trace norm induces the trace distance between two matrices. And then this is the measure that we'll use for distinguishability of quantum states or to measure error or difference between quantum states. So one thing you can prove is that if you take the trace distance between two density matrices and you add a factor of a half in front, the result is you'll always get a number that's between zero and one, okay? And so this normalized trace distance, you can think of as like an error between an ideal state and uh, a noisy version of that ideal state. So something you can prove is that the left-hand side of this inequality is saturated if and only if rho and sigma are the same. So it's kind of easy to see if rho is equal to sigma, then rho minus sigma is the zero matrix and the trace norm of that will be zero. Okay, the other way is a bit more involved. Um, the right-hand side is saturated if and only if rho is orthogonal to sigma. So meaning that rho is perfectly distinguishable from sigma. So then, you know, the, the, the error will be as large as possible. Okay. So if rho and sigma commute, then the trace distance uh, reduces to what's called variational distance in, in classical information theory. Um, the reason that we use the trace distance is that it has, it, it's this principled approach that I was talking about. It has a physical meaning as the, the bias of the optimal success probability in an experiment where you're trying to distinguish rho from sigma. So I don't think I'm gonna get into that in this, in this lecture, but that you can find in, in textbooks, okay? And another important thing is that if you act with the same channel on rho and sigma, then the trace distance does not increase. 
So that's the kind of property you would want for any measure of distinguishability between quantum states. Okay, another measure uh, for, for quantum states, but this is actually a measure of similarity, is that measure is called the fidelity and sometimes called the Ullmann fidelity after the inventor of this measure. So how do you compute it? You take the square root of rho, that's a function of a matrix that we talked about previously. You take the square root of sigma, that's another function of a matrix. So when you do that, you get two matrices, you multiply them, you compute the trace norm and then you square. Okay, so that's the fidelity. If you input pure states, this reduces to the squared overlap or the squared inner product of the two vectors corresponding to the pure states. So, you know, um, th this kind of overlap appears a lot when you study quantum mechanics. And this has an interpretation as the probability that the state phi would pass a test for being in the state psi. And the test would be the measurement with measurement operators psi or identity minus psi, okay? So that's the important, that's the interpretation of fidelity. For density matrices, um, you have similar bounds. The, the, the fidelity is always between zero and one, but the situation is the opposite of the normalized trace distance, right? So in this case, since the fidelity is a measure of similarity, it's, it's the opposite of a measure of distinguishability. And the left-hand side is saturated if and only if rho or are orthogonal, meaning that they're perfectly distinguishable. The right-hand side is saturated if and only if rho and sigma are the same. Okay, so if, if rho and sigma are perfectly similar, meaning that rho equals sigma, then the fidelity is one. And uh, fidelity is always opposite of trace distance. So that kind of data processing inequality that I mentioned on the last line of the previous slide, uh, the fidelity increases under the action of a quantum channel that's common to both rho and sigma. There's something important called Ullmann's theorem, and it's a way that you can compute fidelity. This concept appears across the board in quantum computing, in quantum information, in quantum complexity theory, in quantum cryptography, in many different areas. It's very useful. It's a very kind of quantum thing that you don't see in, in classical information theory. So it says that you can compute the fidelity. You know, previously we said you use this formula, but another way is via this optimization problem. So you take a purification of rho, let's call it psi, a purification of sigma, let's call it phi, and then you compute the overlap between them in this larger dimensional Hilbert space. But now you optimize overall, ref, overall unitaries acting on the reference system, okay? And that's another way you can compute the fidelity. Okay, and it gets used, as I was mentioning, it, get used, it gets used in a variety of areas. There are relations between the fidelity and the trace distance. Um, why is the trace distance useful? It obeys the triangle inequality. That, that kind of thing gets used all the time, right? Uh, fidelity is useful because we have Ullmann's theorem. And then these inequalities relate them. So the kind of thing it tells you is that if trace distance is small, like close to zero, then the fidelity will be close to one and vice versa. Uh, if the fidelity is close to zero, then the normalized trace distance will be close to one. Okay. And then this quantity in the upper bound is often called sign distance uh, for, for a particular reason. Uh, the reason is that the fidelity can be thought of as the cosine of the angle between these two vectors. And so if you take the cosine, sorry, the fidelity is the cosine squared. So if you take cosine squared, subtract it from one and take the square root, that's the sine. And so that's why this is called sine distance. 
Okay. So that's a good time to stop. And next time we'll pick up with entanglement theory.